today we will hear a review of David Kaplan's book, The Most Dangerous Branch. And I'd like to share just a very short excerpt from page 370. Quote, impatiently, myopically, with deep distrust in our elected representatives, we have come to believe that democracy is broken. And we have come to see the justices as our saviors. With so much dysfunction elsewhere in government, the justices see themselves that way too. But we need more politics, not less politics. It is a sign of weakness that we countenance an almighty court to resolve so many of our hardest choices. We do not need, nor should we want, the court to save us from ourselves. Our presenter today is Dr. Timothy Neeland, Professor and Chair of History and Political Science and Director of the Center for Public History at Nazareth College. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. just pull up this uh, PowerPoint presentation. I don't have a lot of slides. But again, if you're not familiar with the book, The Most Dangerous Branch, uh, another way to put it is a joke that Kaplan tells in the middle uh, of his uh, treatise on the Supreme Court today. He says that um, three people die and they go to heaven and they're waiting in line to get in. And St. Peter is at the gate and the first one walks up and St. Peter says, so what did you do in life? I'm a neurosurgeon. I, I saved lives. Peter's like, well, you know, we got a lot of neurosurgeons here. You know, get, I'm sorry. We're not taking any neurosurgeons today. And so then the second person comes up, and St. Peter says, oh, what do you do? Well, he goes, well, you know, I was an ethicist. I, I tried to teach people to live a good life. <laughs> and Peter laughs and says, no, I, I think we have a few of those here already. Thanks. And then the third one comes up and he goes, I guess you don't want me. Um, I'm a psychiatrist. And Peter goes, oh, thank goodness you're here. We need you. And the psychiatrist says, why? He goes, it's God. He thinks he's a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> so I think that gives you a sense of what Kaplan thinks is happening on our US Supreme Court, that they have appropriated to themselves the powers that should be reserved to the people through their government, through their state ledge, or through their con congressional representation. And that we've created then what I would call a new oligarchy that is supplanting the democratic process. So Kaplan himself is a New Yorker, uh, born and raised down uh, state, was uh, I think the son of somebody who taught at Stony Brook uh, there on Long Island. So um, he grew up here and then he went to a good school not too far from here, he went to Cornell University graduated in 78, so he was probably born about 56. And then he went on to NYU, so uh, a good New Yorker. Um, and then from there, he, um, he did work in legal practice for a while, he was a litigator, but then drifted into writing. He's always been a good writer, and I have to say, if you haven't read this book, do so just simply because this is some of the most elegant writing I have read in a long time. Uh, as you heard, I'm an academic, so I read a lot of student papers, ouch. And um, e even worse, other academics. Oh, so bad. Yeah, even my own. Um, but this guy can write, and writes so beautifully. Um, but his, uh, you know, he's, he worked for Newsweek for 20 years. Um, for those of you watching on Facebook who don't know what Newsweek was, it was a publication. <laughs> it was a magazine. Magazines are things that you find at the uh, counter as you check out now. Um, but, um, and for 20 years he wrote on legal affairs, so he knows the Supreme Court well. And that richness comes through in this book. Uh, but he does have an argument, and uh, his argument is pretty clear, right? So uh, he wants to take a look at the court as it got to be where it is today. The book came out in September of 2018, so really he just mentions briefly in the preface Brett Kavanaugh, so we don't get much detail about that. We don't get anything about the confirmation hearings. But of course, everything else uh, up to that is pretty clear. He, um, he does talk a great deal about Anthony Kennedy, who he detests. Um, he does not like Anthony Kennedy, who seemed to think that being the swing made him the king, and so um, he has a lot of negative things to say. But he does, he wants to talk about our current Supreme Court, 
Um, and so he does delve into that uh, some. We'll come back to that, but essentially the premise of the book is that the court acts when it should not, that the court has intruded unconstitutionally into those areas that, that it, it should, shouldn't be permitted to, uh, that it's judicial activism. And he doesn't mean just the conservatives. He means the liberals as well. And he takes a swipe at such things as Roe v. Wade. He even sort of torturously approves of Brown v. Board of Education, but at the same time he thinks that the, the law there was also an activist court. And so um, he really thinks that that's part of the danger. Uh, he admires people like Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., uh, or people like Alexander Bickel, names that may not be familiar to you if you haven't gone through law school, but they were uh, jurists and writers of the law who always felt that restraint, and not necessarily judicial restraint in its, in its full meaning, because that too can be a guise for activism, but literally just thinking carefully about when the Constitution requires you to speak, and maybe sometimes tailoring your work very narrowly. It's because of the activism in the 20th century, Kaplan argues, that our confirmation hearings have become blood sport. And anyone who's seen the last several know that these are bruising contests for politics, things that even back in the 1980s were rare not completely you know, without um, some precedent for them. We all remember when Robert Bork went up to be uh, confirmed and got now, as we call it, Borked. Uh, he was um, declared unfit by uh, Teddy Kennedy within a few hours of the nomination without even any look at what he'd written simply because of who he was. And uh, Robert Bork uh, had a long history. He worked for Richard Nixon and uh, he was the one that fired the special prosecutor in the Watergate hearings and earned the enmity of every liberal in Washington because of that. And he was also quite conservative philosophically, but as you know, so was Tony Scalia and some of the others up there, like Neil Gorsuch. Um, the, the, the terrible figure in all of this is something that we call substantive due process, an idea that comes into the Supreme Court really with one of the worst decisions ever rendered in its history. So what um, Kaplan does is he sets this all up in his prefatory material, talking about confirmation hearings and talking about some of the, the problems with the court. And then he gets into a nice bit where he talks about the characters on the Supreme Court. And I think this serves the purpose of trying to give readers uh, his bona fides as a liberal. Um, I think really, he, he uh, clearly, if you read this book, there is no illusion that this man is a closet conservative. He's never met a conservative he likes. Uh, he um, really uh, just, um, <laughs> just goes through. Um, but he rates people pretty much on how they're activist or not activist. So, for example, as he goes through, he does not like people like Clarence Thomas, right? He, he thinks that Clarence Thomas's uh, rulemaking, uh, originalism and textualism is a fraud. And again, originalism is the uh, attempt to read the Constitution as it was originally intended. Uh, that is, somehow you put on your historical hat Maybe you jump in your TARDIS like Doctor Who and you go back in time and you figure out exactly what it is that they meant when they wrote these words. Textualism is a little different. Then you're looking at statutes, you're looking at laws, you're trying to figure out, okay, what did they mean when they wrote this law? What's, what's the original meaning? So conservatives use that interpretive framework in order to act on behalf of their constituents and to read into law things that didn't exist before. And so people like Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, and of course now Brett Kavanaugh, who would be close to Thomas in his rulings, um, clearly represent that strain. Uh, more careful is uh, John Roberts, the Chief Justice, who's a little more cautious who sometimes tailors his decisions a little more narrowly to the facts of the case rather than expanding it to 
come up with some new right that needs to be enshrined for all Americans. Um, he does not like Kennedy, even though Kennedy was a swing vote, but that's because he didn't find uh, that Kennedy's reasoning was practical beyond the fact that Kennedy spoke when Kennedy felt that there was a need. And he has a long rip on how Kennedy decided to resign. He didn't tell anyone, and he gets in a car, and he has himself driven to the White House, and he has himself announced to the president, and he walks into the Oval Office, and he tells the president he's leaving. That's not how Supreme Court justices retire. They usually let other people know, and they usually just send a note up. But like some imperial person you know, declining his throne, he decided to do it in, in the kind of Kennedy-esque fashion. On the other hand, you've got, uh, on, the, on the farther left, you've got Ginsburg and Sotomayor. And I will say, uh, if you like the notorious RBG, if you've seen the documentary or the new movie, A Matter of Sex, um, Ginsburg comes off very well in this writing. Uh, she comes off very saintly, although, you know, she is an activist, according to Kaplan, and therefore intrudes in areas where a more circumspect reasoning might help. Sotomayor, who has the best-selling book of, I think, collectively everyone <laughs> on the court, also comes off as a big personality and someone who um, is very hard to work for and uh, very, works very long hours. I guess this is you damning with faint praise, right? Like She works really hard and makes her clerks work really hard and, and that's just terrible and she can't find a date and it's tough to be a, a professional woman and uh, such things as that. Um, Kagan and Breyer are actually the two favorites of Kaplan. He finds that uh, Stephen Breyer, who often doesn't get noticed, <laughs> and he thinks that's a shame, is a very careful writer and often looks for consensus and ways to create judicial decisions that will not speak above and beyond the facts of the case in front of them. And it, you know, Breyer sought, for example, consensus and. Um, you know, Bush v. Gore and some other cases. And so he calls him uh, a pragmatist, which is probably the highest praise Kaplan can give you in this book. Anybody who's a pragmatist is good. Uh, anybody who's an activist is bad. Um, but he calls him a, a, a careful pragmatist, um, even though, um, and, he, and he does spend three pages blasting originalism and textualism. He only spends about a paragraph talking about you know, uh, some of the other, the living constitution. And I will say, I've read um, Stephen Breyer's book on active liberty, and that falls within the realm of a kind of living constitution. It's a, it's a good book, by the way. Um, you buttress uh, Breyer with a reading of Scalia's, uh, you know, original intent, and you get a really interesting view on what the court really thinks. But Kagan has read them and, and thoroughly. Um, um, I should say Kaplan. Kagan um, also comes through. Elena Kagan, very quiet, uh, very circumspect, but again, also a careful writer. So clustered together, that to Kaplan would be your ideal Supreme Court. And he does say this, and I think, I think this is a really good perceptive statement. When you can guess the outcome of a case based upon who appointed these justices, you have a problem. Right? If you look back even prior to the 1970s, no one knew, for example, that Earl Warren would fashion a unanimous decision in Brown. Right? That, that when you appointed people like David Souter even, right, back in the day, you didn't know that Souter would join the so-called liberal wing of the court. That is, there seemed to be less um, attempt to use the Supreme Court as politics by other means in the old days. Not that they didn't look for a judicial temperament, uh, not that they didn't try to fill some political bucket. Certainly even in the 19th century, you appointed people to the Supreme Court based upon what part of the country they came from. Right? You have to have some sort of regional balance. But I think clearly Kaplan uh, regrets how our court has uh, devolved since the beginning of time. And then he begins to go through a series of cases. And, and the first time you see uh, a substantive due process used is in the Dred Scott v. Sanford decision, where the Supreme Court took the idea of the Fifth Amendment uh, right of due process, you, one cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process, and began to enlarge it to recognize rights that were not spelled out in the Constitution, and that's really the problem, right? That, that reading this 
um, in what was, became a 7-2 decision uh, against Dred Scott uh, and against the Missouri Compromise and against any attempts by the legislature, right, our duly constituted, you know, Article One, maybe you know, very important uh, part of our federal government that that the decisions by the legislature were set aside by the court, which then found that somehow there was a right to own other human beings embedded in this idea of liberty, property, and life. And since then, um, this idea of due process and the Fifth Amendment and then reborn in the Fourteenth Amendment requirements that states abide by due process has allowed the activist state to engage. Right? So it's this interesting interpretive framework. Now, um, this comes back in the infamous Lochner versus New York case. And you might remember this from uh, uh, high school history textbooks, or uh, if you've read Kaplan, you know that he gets a deep dive into this. But this was the case where New York State decided to pass um, maximum hours for workers in the progressive era. And it was a little sexist. No, but anyway, um, but, it was, um, but the idea was that the legislature gets to decide Right? I mean, the legislature decided there needed to be maximum hours. And Lochner Home Bakery sued, saying that this was a violation of his rights in due process. And the courts agreed and said that there is something called the liberty of contract, which became an infamous cudgel by the Supreme Court to strike down progressive legislation and, in fact, New Deal legislation right up until uh, McReynolds um, uh, case. So really, if you look at this, this idea then was that somehow implied in the Constitution was that workers and employers could work as many hours as they wanted or, uh, or required people to do. And that really, I think, um, is, is the basis for um, the uh, concerns that Kaplan has, and he then goes on to cite Justice Holmes, whose two-paragraph dissent once again uh, was a cautious reminder to the court that it's not, it wasn't so much the outcome, it was the decision to even take this case. It should have been referred back to the states. It should have been ignored. It should have, they should have allowed the states to work this out politically um, rather than assume a new standard of law for all Americans, which, again, the you know, outcome was that it helped uh, corporations at the expense of individuals who then had no recourse through their state legislature to remedy this because the courts had acted. And so that really is disturbing. He, um, he does talk about Brown, and again, he, <laughs> he doesn't want to say anything bad about it, so it, he sort of um, works his way around that. Uh, he recognizes that it's a kind of activism. Um, but uh, he really saves his fire for Roe v. Wade. Um, and again, there he, he felt that this idea that the courts grasped for that there was a fundamental right to privacy and this concept of a penumbra of rights embedded in the Ninth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment and the Fourth Amendment and uh, all of this just created yet a unique set when they could have just struck down the Texas statute on very narrow reasoning. They could have ended that. And instead, Roe v. Wade ended up becoming the Pandora's box for opening up what became this most contested. Roe v. Wade becomes the litmus test, right? If you look at the political parties in the 1970s and, 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 and Roe v. Wade, it wasn't on the front page, really. I mean, it wasn't such a big deal. States were already moving towards recognizing abortion rights. New York State had, good heavens, Ronald Reagan had signed an abortion, uh, pro-abortion uh, act into law in California. Roe v. Wade, in many ways, then takes control of the women's movement and reproductive rights, um, in some ways, trump economic rights, going you know, back to Margaret Sanger who, you know, and others who have argued about this, the Charlotte Perkin Gilman's, Margaret Sanger, what is the most important right? Well, they're all important, um, but what is the most politically uh, expedient? Roe v. Wade, he takes the task for doing that and 
Um, then this leads to confirmation hearings in the 1980s that are, are built around Roe v. Wade. So nowadays, um, you've got justices who go up before the Senate and say nothing. Right? They, they're, tr they're coached to not say anything. You don't know. Uh, well, you do know because you, you know who's appointing them. But that becomes the game then. Um, uh, Democrats want people who are going to assure that Roe v. Wade will never fall. Republicans want a, a conservative who will somehow say that Roe v. Wade is bad. And even if they're just saying this in private, they want this sort of guarantee to send people up to the Supreme Court. And again, um, the result, he points out, is that very much if, if the Supreme Court had acted more circumspectly and left it to the state legislatures, you'd probably have the situation you have today. Liberal states have uh, very liberal laws allowing abortion on demand, and you have conservative states that have restricted it almost out of existence. And um, yet in between, we have had 40 years of culture wars uh, set aside by that. So he's not happy with that particular decision, and he thinks that it was reached. He has a lot of nasty things to say for Harry Blackman, who wrote it, and he goes, this trimester thing is a nonsense on stilts, and uh, you know, just the way uh, poorly written, even, even Ginsburg back in the day did not say nice things about Roe v. Wade because of the way it was written and decided, not necessarily the outcome. Uh, and again, Kaplan is very careful to say, not a conservative. Uh, District Columbia versus Heller uh, is another case. He talks about a lot of cases. He gets all the way up to Janus. But District of Columbia, he sees this as the conservatives' revenge on Roe v. Wade. Again, finding rights that didn't exist before. For 150 plus years, the idea that the Second Amendment only regulated the militia and not recognized the private right to own firearms was settled law. The Supreme Court upheld the 1934 Gun Control Act, the 1968 Gun Control Act. And then, suddenly, they begin to use scholarship created since the 1970s and 80s. And it was only in the 1970s that the NRA went from supporting gun control, by the way, to making gun control the issue. And today, if you want to know the difference between a Democrat and a Republican, Ask them how they feel about guns. That is probably the most wide gap. And so this was an attempt, and certainly by the more conservative members of the court, to once again expand into a right that was not clearly articulated in the Constitution. And in fact, Kaplan will say the Second Amendment is the most poorly written amendment you can ever find. There's clauses on clauses. I mean, what does it mean? Uh, well, apparently it means whatever the Rorschach test of the Supreme Court says it means. So after District uh, Columbia versus Heller, the conservatives were able to recognize that owning a firearm is an individual right recognized in Constitution. And then they took on the Chicago case so that they could expand that beyond what the federal government could control to the states. Uh, and then again, he goes on uh, uh, case after case. But you get the point. What he's doing is he's going through these cases carefully, looking at both at liberal and conservative cases, saving most of his fire for conservatives, um, to, uh, to talk about the problems with the Supreme Court. Um, again, just, just overall, I would say that um, this is a, a, a fascinating read, and having read books like this in the past, like The Brethren, if you ever read that one, Scott uh, you know, Ambrose and uh, uh, Bob Woodward, the sort of inside of the Burger Court, and we've got great books by like Linda Greenhouse, you know, Becoming Black Mum, and some terrific, this is very much in the vein, very well written, um, and um, his prescription is this. You don't try to play around with the Supreme Court. Don't put them in for 18 years and, uh, or uh, you know, have them serve for several years. These are all ideas being floated by uh, people who want to fix the court. Obviously, court packing is one that we've heard from uh, candidates running for the Democratic nomination. Let's just keep adding justices till we get the right number. But that only exacerbates the problem, right? I mean, that's exactly the problem that Kaplan wants to end. 18-year um, term limits. Yeah, maybe, but then you're still going to have these confirmation hearings, and so that could be a problem. Um, he would say then, 
the, the solution lies in the court itself. And he, and he does have one hope, and that hope is John Roberts. Justice, Chief Justice John Roberts, who joined with the liberals in deciding in NTF, the uh, Sebelius case, that in fact the um, Affordable Care Act was a tax. He rejected the idea that the Commerce Clause would allow them to impose a personal mandate, but if it was a tax, relying on narrowly written, careful, constructed law, and also Roberts acknowledging he didn't like the outcome, but he said that politics needs to be left to the legislative branch. That's his hope, that John Roberts will reassert himself and will the best saving for the Supreme Court is inside the Supreme Court to stop thinking of themselves as demigods who need to fix us, who need to fix Congress because it's broken, who need to step in because states are full of fools, right? Uh, that's what he, what he would prescribe. Um, and again, just to quickly wrap up, you know, liberal bias, yes. Uh, beautifully written, sure. Snarky. Yeah, if you liked Vice or you like uh, you know movies like that, you'll like this read. I, I'm not a big fan of snark. I like to save that for the classroom. Uh, so, uh, but um, overall, nicely written. So now it's time for Q and A. Uh, 